Welcome back to JT Ministries. Today, Pastor Gary bring us another Bible study on the book of 1 Corinthians. I hope you enjoy it, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. We have a free PDF Bible for download down in the description. Thank you for tuning in. Now, here is Pastor Gary. Good to see everybody tonight. Let's jump right into our study. We're going to be 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 tonight, so take your Bibles with uh, me if you would and open them there, 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. Uh, we, we will provide Bibles for you if you need one, so raise a hand. One of these fine gentlemen coming down the aisles will be glad to throw a Bible your way uh, in a gentle, sort of loving way. Um, if you just raise your hand, they'll, they'll find you. 1 Corinthians 8, it's found on page 852 in the church Bibles. Page 852 in the church Bibles. So I am lifting our PG-13 ban that we've had in place for the last couple of Wednesday nights. Uh, if you weren't here uh, the last two Wednesday nights, it took us two weeks to get through chapter seven. It was all about singleness, marriage, sex, and divorce. So now if you missed it, you're, you're like, wow, what, what was that all about? Um, go to the teaching library, it's all on there. No pictures, but it is, uh, it, it is, it is, uh, it is posted on the teaching library. Uh, tonight we're here, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, let me read through the chapter and then we will um, highlight basically, uh, we're just going to read through chapter 8 and, and then I'm just going to kind of summarize first what chapters 8 and 9 are about and then we'll come back and dig out these chapters. So, and, uh, so let's, let's look here at chapter 8 together. It says this, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many, quote, gods, small g, and many, quote, lords, small l, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom, circle that word freedom, does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. All right, your attention before we pray. So 1 Corinthians, we're going to look at chapters 8 and 9 tonight. Lord willing, we'll get through both chapters. And both of these chapters really express something important, and that's the reason I had you circle the word freedom, because these two chapters ask two questions. The first question is, what kind of freedom does a Christian have? Okay, remember, the Corinthian church, primarily Gentile converts, uh, some Jewish believers in Christ, and so because predominantly this congregation are Gentiles who have come to faith in Christ, uh, they are bringing with them all of the idolatry and all of the baggage of a Roman culture. This is first century Roman Empire. That's all they've known. They get saved. They come into the church. So now they want to know what kind of freedom do we have? Or is Christianity just simply a bunch of rules? What are some of the things we can do with some of the things we can't do? So Paul's going to basically answer this question, what kind of freedom does a Christian have? And then further in the chapter, chapter 9, he's going to ask, answer, could a misuse of my freedom disqualify me? Serious questions that are being asked that he answers in the course of chapters 8 and 9. Now, you know, this is an important topic for all of us, and particularly for those of you who perhaps have grown up in a fundamental 
Christian home or church, okay? This is an important question for people who have not grown up in church at all, by the way. But in particular, for those of you who grew up in a fundamental Christian home or church, and I believe in the fundamental faith, okay, and the fundamentals of the faith. But by fundamental, I know kind of a legalistic, strict upbringing in a home or a church, all right? These might be some important questions for you to get answered tonight as well. We're going to put the fun back in fundamentalism, friends, because it's not all about a bunch of rules and legalism. But that said, you know, even, even Paul will say to the church in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5, 13, he says, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. And Peter would echo a similar thing in 1 Peter 2, 16. He says, live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. He says, live as servants of God. So we need to get a healthy understanding of freedom because we don't want to go all crazy and start just doing whatever we jolly well want to do because that's indulging the sinful nature. At the same time, we don't want to live such legalistic lives that our perception of God and the Christian faith is simply a bunch of rules and regulations. All right, so we're going to look at some of these things tonight here from chapters 8 and 9. Let's first have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you that you love us and that you gave your son Jesus to die for us. And Lord, we just approach our study tonight with humility, and we thank you for your grace, Lord, that we can grow in our knowledge of these things that maybe for some has been a difficult journey of just rules and regulations. And for others, maybe they've misused their freedom, Lord, and they have indulged the sinful nature. And we just, we just pray that no matter where we are on that spectrum of either legalism or indulging the sinful nature, Lord, that we would come to a place of balance and centrality in our faith, Lord, based on Jesus and the cross, and that we would have a healthy and a biblical perspective in regards to this subject of our freedoms, and that you would help us to walk in step with your Holy Spirit, Lord, knowing what is right, knowing what is wrong, wanting to honor you, but not wanting to be trapped in either legalism or in this kind of free-for-all freedom. So help us, Lord, as we study through these chapters. We love you. We just give you all praise and glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Chapter 8, let's start again at verse 1. Here's their question that Paul answers, now about food, sacrifice to idols. Remember that through the letter uh, that Paul writes here to the church of Corinth, he's addressing various issues and questions and concerns. That's the way chapter 7 begins in verse 1. He says, now for the matters you wrote about, and he talks about marriage and singleness, sex and divorce. They had questions about relationships. Now they've got questions here in chapter 8 about food sacrifice to idols. Because again, this first century Rome, let's put it in some context. In that day, it was a polytheistic structure. People worshiped many gods. And so what would typically happen is, in the Roman meat market, you'd actually go and, you know, in the days of no refrigeration, so they would slaughter an animal, and then they would sell it that day in the meat market. And you had to go and, and you know, buy a pot roast for dinner that night. Well, because it was a Roman culture, what would happen is in the Roman civilization, when they would, when they would first offer these the, you know, different cuts of meat to, to be sold in the market, they would dedicate all of this to their various gods, which are idols, because they aren't real. Now, you're a Christian now. You've just come to faith in Jesus. You're going through the meat market. You want to buy a pot roast to take home. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, all this stuff was offered first to some idol, and so now all this stuff is bad. We can't have a pot roast for dinner tonight. And so Paul's addressing this. Now this might seem like a ridiculous question to us because you know, we don't, we don't, you know, you don't, you don't go to Safeway or Giant or Whole Foods or wherever you, you shop and you, you don't, you don't you know, worry about, well, this was kind of offered up to idols. But this is a cultural thing that helps us to understand other kinds of cultural issues. For them, it was this issue of meat is offered to idols, can I buy this and eat it with a clear conscience? Now, Paul starts out this chapter by basically saying this. He says again, look at verse 1. He says, we know that all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And what he's going to build on here in this passage is this. If you understand God and 
the false gods, if you have knowledge about the true and living God versus false gods, then you know that because these gods that are, you know, small g don't exist, then food that is dedicated to them doesn't make the food bad to eat because the gods don't even exist, right? So he says, if you have that knowledge, don't walk around simply with that knowledge like, well, I can eat whatever I want. Though you can because knowledge could puff you up. The better thing is love that will build others up. And he's going to emphasize this whole thing through chapters 8 and 9 about how our faith is not exclusively about us. This is very important for us to understand. So again, forget the culture part about, well, we don't have meat today that's offered up to false gods. I get that. But we have this issue to deal with. Your faith and my faith must take other people into consideration on all levels. If you want your faith to be real, you have to also be considerate about other people. So Paul says, you might have the knowledge that no matter what this meat was you know, offered to, that it doesn't taint or spoil the meat, you have a better and a bigger issue here to be concerned about. And that is, what about other people who could be possibly offended by your freedom? He's going to get into all of this, so let's keep reading here. So he says in verse 4, so then about food, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, okay, that there's no God but one, for even if, if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. He says then in verse 7, but not everyone knows this. Okay, so not everyone might be as informed as you that even though this meat was offered to some false god and you know it's okay and it's clean to eat, not everybody knows this. So, you better be careful and consider about other people. He says, keep reading, verse 7, some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God, so we are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. He's talking about you know, the meat in particular that's been offered to idols. And then here's the key verse. Look at verse 9. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, under the, underline the words stumbling block, or highlight them in your Bibles. And we're going to come back to this, but, but first, for you note-takers, I just want to kind of summarize this whole idea about our freedom throughout the book, book of 1 Corinthians, because Paul is going to not specifically address a list of things that you can do or can't do, all right? And I'm thankful that he doesn't, you know, make a list, because then that does start to get into legalism. You know, it would be like if, and, and here are some hot button topics, okay? Maybe not hot button to you, but I can tell you in, you know, almost 30 years of ministry, these kind of things are hot button topics for some people in the church. Things like music, music, things like alcohol, things like movies, television, uh, attire. What you, what you can, you know, wear, what is inappropriate. And so there's all kinds of opinions about what's appropriate attire, what's not, what, what are okay movies to go to, what's not. You know, is it okay to drink alcohol at all? If so, how much before you get buzzed and then it becomes a sin? So where's that line? And then everybody's, what kind of music? Is it only Christian worship music? Can we listen to some secular music too? And, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And people have these kind of questions and they're legitimate. Because if you really want to be sincere in your faith towards God, you want to ask yourself some questions like, well, what would God think of this? Because I got, I, I got news for you. There's not a verse in the Bible about music, in particular about secular music. You know, there's a lot in the Bible about music and worship, but not in regards to, you know, secular music. There, there's not a verse in the Bible about smoking, okay? You know, I mean, there's verses in the Bible about your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and all that good stuff. 
But there's not a specific, particular chapter and verse about smoking. I've said this many times. Smoking won't make you go to hell. It'll just make you smell like you've been there, right? <laughs> and so, you know, there, and, and so people want to know, where's the verse about, can I smoke? And how, is, it, is it one a day? Is it a pack a day? How much, how much can I smoke? Where's a Bible verse for that? You know, and, so, and, and people want to know these questions, okay? So this is the church in Corinth. They're, they're like, so is it okay to eat some of this meat? You know, is it okay for this stuff? So here's a quick survey in the letter of 1 Corinthians, because here's what Paul does. Instead of making a list of here are the things you can't do, and here are the things you can do, here's what he does do. He calls us to ask ourselves four particular questions. And these four particular questions that I'm going to take you through will serve to be a litmus test that each of us must ask ourselves in relation to some of those, if you will, gray topics. Okay? And so go back to chapter 6. I want to, I want to summarize all four of these questions together. And we're going to go back to chapter 6. And here's the first question. Is it less than beneficial? Is it less than beneficial? So chapter 6, look at verse 12. He says here, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. So stop right there. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Now again, he doesn't mean permissible in, in the sense of permissiveness. He just means in terms of what, what, what are okay, what things in God's eyes that there's not a specific commandment about, okay? He's, again, he's not trying to have such license with his life that he can do whatever he wants and indulge his sinful nature. He's clear about that in other epistles. Again, Galatians 5.10, for example. But he wants to know in regards to certain things that are, quote, okay, uh, how do I know if it's okay? And one of the questions we are to ask ourselves is, is it less than beneficial because he says all things are permissible but not everything is beneficial not everything is good for us so we need to ask ourselves is it potentially detrimental for me rather than being good for me because even though it might be okay if it is not good for me then it is not right for me now again this may vary for each individual to some degree Again, we're not talking about clearly defined sinful things in the Bible. We're talking about areas of some liberty. And what you might have as a certain liberty in a certain area may not be an area I feel the freedom in, and vice versa. And so what we need to do is ask ourselves some of these questions. Is it okay? All right, everything's permissible as long as it's not sinful, but not everything is beneficial. It may not be good for me. Um, I, I will, you know, ask myself these questions in relation to stuff that I watch, and, you know, our family together, you know, at different times. Is this an okay TV show? Do we feel okay about this? Do we have a clear conscience about this? Is this the kind of movie we want to go to? Uh, you know, is this, is this not a good movie to go to? Um, how many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever gone to a movie and in the middle of it felt like, ah, this, not just because it was a terrible movie, but because you felt like, ah, this is personally offensive and you got up and walked out of a movie. Let me see your hands. Good for you. Good for you. By the way, you can get your money back for that. I don't know if you knew that. You don't have to just leave empty handed. You can leave and go up to the counter and say, I don't like this movie. It was offensive to me. They will give you your money back in case you didn't know that. That's, that's happened on a few occasions. I, I speak from personal experience. But anyhow. So I'm going to give you an example. Now, and, and this is an example. This is purely an example of my personal conviction, okay? It doesn't have to be yours. It's my conviction. So a few years ago, a movie came out called Lone Survivor. I'm not going to ask who saw it. It doesn't really matter to the story here, okay? And it was a story about the Navy SEAL team and um, unfortunately a tragic uh, attempt to, um, uh, to go on a mission in Afghanistan, kill a Taliban leader. Um, Here's the thing, true story, true story, valiant heroes, valiant heroes, some people lost their lives uh, serving our country, okay? But the movie also had 150 F-bombs in it. Now, can you legitimately do a movie about a Navy SEAL rescue team trying to take out a Taliban leader and avoid that language? Really not. If you wanted to be realistic, you know, I'm sure the guys, you know, those kind of guys are not sitting around going drats. You know, I mean, they're just, they're not, okay? 
So they're not, they're not on the battlefield going fudge. You know, they're not doing that. So I get that. If you really want it to be realistic, you're probably gonna have to do all that. But see, personally, I felt like that's, that's not good for me. I don't want, the, I don't want 150 F-bombs in, in my spirit. So I won't go to something like that. That's me, all right? Now, my wife and I have a personal conviction that there's really not much that is beneficial in an R-rated movie anyway. That's us. That doesn't have to be you. There, frankly, are some PG-13 movies we got up and walked out of before. You know, so um, it, it, it comes down to asking yourself some questions because you have to live with your clear conscience. And so again, I don't make that as any reference to any shame. If you saw Lone Survivor, that's your deal and you can have a clear conscience about it. That is one example where I just wouldn't be able to. Because I, I just don't think that would be good for me. So I don't want that in my spirit. I don't want to sit there for two hours and hear the F-bomb drop more than 150 times. By the way, a good resource, in case you don't know, is plugged in online. Um, if, you, if you go to that website, they will critique movies ahead of time so you know this kind of stuff before you even have to go to a theater, pluggedinonline.com. So that's a good resource if you want to screen movies. Um, but, I, you know, these are the kind of questions we need to ask ourselves. All right, so every person needs to settle certain things in his or her heart so that you can have a clear conscience. That's, that's the bottom line for this first question. Is it permissible? Okay, it might be, but is it beneficial? And if it's not, then I, I, don't, I don't wanna exercise my freedom in that area because it may not be good for me, all right? Second question is in the rest of that verse. Look again, still here, chapter six, verse 12. Everything is permissible to me, but not everything is beneficial. And then he says, everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So that's question number two. Could it master me? If, if you answer yes to any of these questions, then you are misusing your freedom. Could it potentially master me? It's an important question. Is it potentially addictive? And could it take control of my life? It might be okay, but okay does not make it right if I could become a slave to it. Simple example, I had a friend years ago who was a great investment banker and realtor, and this guy was flipping property and making money hand over fist. But he said to me one day, he said, Gary, I had to just walk away from all of it. I said, why? He said, because I would be up late on my computer into the wee hours of the morning, crunching numbers and obsessing with my investments and, and making sure that everything was you know, profitable and what do I have to trade as soon as the stock market opens up the next morning and that opening bell, I gotta start to trade. And he says, I was going nuts. I was actually going crazy and I, was, I wasn't you know, engaged with my family. I was neglecting my wife. Stock market's not wrong. Real estate investment's not wrong. All those things are okay. But in his case, you see, he said, I became obsessed with it and it became something that controlled me and it became addictive. I had to walk away from it. And these are the questions we have to ask ourselves. It, it, it might be certainly okay, but if it has the potential to master us, control us, become addicting, it's not good. So don't use your freedom then if it has the potential to master you. Then he asks here, now go back to chapter eight where we were. In chapter eight, here's the third question that he, that he asks in verse nine. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So here's the third question. Could it stumble others? Does my freedom have the potential of stumbling others? Now this is, this is a very challenging question because again, it means that your Christian faith is not just exclusively about you. And some people have that misguided notion. They think, well, I'm just gonna do whatever I wanna do because it's just between me and Jesus. No, it is not. And people need to get this, because I know too many people who don't get this. They think, it's just about me and Jesus. It's, what, it's whatever Jesus thinks is okay, and I have a clear conscience about, that's what I'm going to do. Now, you've got to ask these questions. And the third one is, well, wait a minute. In the exercise of my freedom, could it, all, could it damage somebody potentially? Could it be a bad witness to somebody, even though I know it's cool? If they have a problem with it, I need to take them into consideration. Your faith is not limited to your own bubble, your faith should be something that you live out with the potential of it either being a catalyst to bring someone to Christ, okay? 
This is what your faith will always be, either a catalyst to lead somebody to Christ, to point them in that direction, or it will be a stumbling block to somebody from coming to faith in Christ. And perhaps they are already in Christ and they're just a new believer, and now the exercise of your freedom has caused them to just, you know, wig out because they don't understand why you're able to do what you're able to do. And so we need to remember that it is not our right to exercise our freedom if in the exercise of our freedom it will cause other people to stumble. And Paul says here, he says, you know, in essence, they are spiritually weaker because he says they don't have the, in this context, he goes, they don't have the knowledge that, you know, all this meat is a-okay, it doesn't really matter. You know, if, if somebody offers you today, if they offered you a steak and said, you know, before I gave you this steak, you know, I offered it to Buddha, you could care less, right? I mean, if you know Christ, you care less. your only question is, you know, how can I have my steak done? You know, you don't, you don't really care that it was offered to Buddha. And so, but, but yet at the same time, he says, but because there's some weak people here and they don't understand that it's okay, don't, don't eat it in front of them. You know, don't, don't puff up with knowledge and say, well, I know, I know the food is okay, and it's a shame that you don't, but I'm going to eat it anyway and chow them down. You know, recognize that the better thing is that love builds up. Sometimes people, in the exercise of their freedom, have put more value on their rights than they have on other people. And so this whole section here is, is about that. He says in verse 10, For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, because at that time they had some of the meat markets there by the idol temples, won't he be emboldened to eat what he has been sacrificed, what has been sacrificed to idol? In other words, he's going to see you and go, I guess it's okay, but then he'll eat. He doesn't have a clear conscience. You do. Now his conscience is violated. So he says, when you sin, notice what, it, what he calls it. It's a sin, verse 12. Well, verse 11, so this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge, verse 12, when you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. This is being sensitive to other people around you, not knowing where they might be in their faith or if they have faith at all. Remember uh, when we were back in Romans, and you can turn back, it's only a couple of pages, otherwise I'll just read it. Back in Romans chapter 14, um, Paul was emphasizing this in his, in his letter to the Romans as well. In Romans chapter 14, uh, verse 13, he says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. Okay, it goes back to this whole conscience thing. If, if you have a clear conscience, great. If somebody sitting next to you doesn't, then th they have to be true to their conscience. He says in, in Romans 14, 15, if your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Later down, Romans 14, 19, he says, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat, sacrifice to idols, or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. Okay? Everybody get this? So it is important to recognize this. Um, you know, again, in some of these areas where, you know, how much is too much, what is right, what is wrong, on the whole topic of alcohol. Um, and, and Paul mentions it there in Romans 14. We, we have to be sensitive that you might have that freedom, but somebody you go to dinner with may not. So, you know, don't, don't assume, ask. If you want the liberty, and you're having some, you know, dinner, and you want the liberty to have a glass of wine with dinner, and you have, you have friends over, you're out at a restaurant, ask. Would you be offended by this? And if they are honest and said no, then fine. If they are honest and say yes, then at that point, you should give up your, quote, freedom for the sake of your friends. And that's the way it works. All right? 
There's a fourth question. Go to chapter 10. I know we're skipping around a little bit, but I want to put all this in context. Our freedom. Fourth question in chapter 10, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 10, 23. Everything is permissible. He uses that phrase again. But not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible. But not everything is constructive. Not everything is constructive. Now, if you have a New King James or an ESV, it says, but not all things edify. So that's the fourth question on our list. Does it lack edification? And specifically, he's asking in terms of other people. Will this build other people up or or will this have the opposite effect and so it is an important question to ask does it lack edification again if we answer yes to any of these questions we are misusing our freedom and so we have to recognize that in regards to this last question our aim should be to build others up that the christian faith is not about seeking our own good but also about the good of others and primarily about the good of others. So be others-minded, be others-centered, and make sure that what you do in the exercise of your freedom is beneficial, doesn't control or master me, would not stumble others, and at least would be edifying of others and would not lack edification. All right, go back here to chapter 9 now. See if we can race through chapter 9. So Paul is going to now use some examples here about his own personal freedoms that he doesn't exercise, uh, just to give them an example of his own story. And at the same time, he's going to defend his apostleship, because apparently some are questioning, do you really have the authority to talk about all this, Paul? And so he's going to use himself as an example of freedoms and rights that he gave up. At the same time, he's going to be defending uh, his ministry as an apostle. So chapter 9, verse 1, he says, am I not free? I have freedom, in other words. He says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Okay, remember, Paul founded the church at Corinth, and he spent 18 months there ministering to them, building them up in their faith. So he's like, you know, I, I was with you for like a year and a half. Do you not know that I'm an apostle? And he says in verse 3, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Now, the argument he's going to make here is he has the right as the apostle that founded their church to be supported by them. The fact is that he's not going to be supported by them. So he's going to use this as an example. I've invested in you. I've poured my life into you. I never took a dime from you. I had the right to do it. You could have and should have supported me, but I chose not to have you support me financially. And I worked instead to support myself so that I would never be a burden on you. But I could have exercised my rights. So it's going to be an example here how he gave up his own rights. He says, he says, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? In other words, at, at, at your expense. Okay. He says, don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas, that's Peter, or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? He says, you know, basically says these other guys bring their wives along and the ministries where they serve support them and their families, their wives. Um, he says, you know, Barnabas and I, we chose not to work, but we could ask for support from you as well. In verse 7, he says, Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses. This is in Deuteronomy 25, 4. Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? Okay, so pause for a moment. So he's basically using examples. He says, look, you know, the the farmer... Um, 
sows a vineyard and is able to eat grapes from the vineyard. A, sh a shepherd is able to, you know, eat of the flock. Um, and then he uses the example here from Deuteronomy 25, 4, that even when oxen were used to trample out the grain, they wouldn't muzzle the oxen. They would allow the oxen to eat as they were working. And so Paul's using this as an example. He goes, you know, I have the right to ask you to support me materially. You're the church I founded. You're the church I invested in. You could invest in me. I have the right to do this. But now he's going to give this as an example of, okay, but some freedoms we give up, some rights we give up for the benefit of others. He says, next, next verse, he says, but we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. I have that verse underlined in my Bible right there. Those who <laughs> preach the gospel should have their... And, and, you know, and, and, and that's, that's because of your generosity that the pastors are supported here. Because as we teach the gospel, we receive support from those that we are ministering to. That's what he says here. It's, it's all part of, uh, of the way that God desires it. So he goes on in verse uh, 15, but I have not used any of these rights. Now see, I'm not that spiritual, so I, I have to use that right. He goes, and, and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And you know, honestly, those of us who feel a calling in ministry, we understand what he's saying here. It's like, you know, are there other things that we possibly could do? Possibly. But if we don't preach the gospel and we have a calling on our lives, then, then woe to us. And so he, he's taking it personally, as all should who are, who are in ministry. In verse 17, he says, if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Okay, so that's his whole argument. He's like, you know, I, again, I, I'm not taking anything from you. I could, but I, I give up my rights because I don't want anyone to feel like I'm trying to take advantage of them by asking you to support me. I could, but I won't, all right? And you know, the, if somebody's in a position to do that, it's a wonderful thing. I, I heard years ago that Rick Warren, after a pastor of Saddleback Church in California, after he wrote The Purpose Driven Life, it, he made so much in the royalties that he decided no longer gonna take any, any uh, salary from his church. And so, you know, that was a personal decision that he came to. And, you know, God bless him for, for uh, such a, a lucrative book deal. Um, I, I haven't written a book. And so I, uh, <laughs> so I, I don't, I'm not exercising that, that privilege there. Anyway, let's move on. Um, and, and so now verse 19, he says, he says this, though I am free and belong to no man. Okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm free in Christ. He says, I make myself a slave to everyone, note this, to win as many as possible. Notice how just consumed he is here, in a good way, with others. How focused are we on others? Is our faith just about us? He says, I'm free, but I make myself a slave. I do whatever I need to do to win as many as possible. He gives some examples. Verse 20, to the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Now he, now he is a Jew, but what he's saying here is he would still participate in some of the feasts because he knows that in this way he'll be relatable to his fellow Jews. He goes on to say to those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so as to win those under the law. He has a heart for his fellow Jews. They're strict according to the law. And he says, I, I, I wanted to be careful with the commandments of God so as to not offend and to be relatable to my fellow Jews. But notice in verse 21, he, he even says to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law so as to win those not having the law. 
To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I love that verse. I've become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. By the way, notice the word some. He has no illusions that he's going to win all to Christ. He knows that there will be some who will come to faith through his influential life. And the same is true for you and me. Now, this is not a, this is not a game. All right? You know, we, we know people, right? I hope, I hope we're not one of these kind of people. We know, we know people who... They, they just become a chameleon. And, and wherever they are, they just become like everybody else just because they want to fit in. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is, and if you, if you want to write in the margin of your Bible, that, that faith often comes because you are relatable through relationships. Relatable through relationships. Okay, he's, he's not saying I change like a chameleon to adapt myself to whatever environment and therefore I become compromising to just be like everybody else so I can be everybody's buddy and I can be all politically correct and I can be accepted in whatever circle I go to. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying here is though he identifies with each person that he has the opportunity to befriend and he just connects with them on a level that would be relatable. We have to stop this mentality of pious Christianity, of walking around like, you know, I'm too, I'm too good for you. I'm too cool for school, you know, and I don't, I don't want to associate with you, okay? And they might be totally different, but those are the people that we're called to reach. So we can't have this mentality of exclusiveness, of just, you know, it, of being so removed from the world that we no longer know how to relate to it and connect to the very people who need Christ that you have. So he says, you know, when, when, I'm, when I'm with the Jews, I, I relate to them as Jews. When I'm with Gentiles, I relate to the Gentiles. I, I don't compromise myself. I don't do anything that would bring shame to Christ. But I am going to relate to them on some level where I can connect with them and thereby connect the cross of Christ. I hope that in your relationships and in your friendships, in your in your. Uh, influence with coworkers and, and neighbors and that, that you find some entry point in their lives that does not cause you to compromise but allows you to connect. Okay? Connection, not compromise. Draw the line there and realize, okay, when my conscience and the commandments start to get violated, then, you know, no more connection. But at some point, we have to find an entry point of being able to be relatable enough that people will actually want what we have. Not in a salesman kind of a way, but just in a genuine kind of a way. That if we want people to know Christ, we're going to have to be a little relatable in a lost and dying world. And look for ways that you can connect and relate to people. Uh, what, you know, one of the things that I uh, started doing just, just because it, it was something when they needed, when my kids were playing Little League Baseball, and they just kind of needed dads to step out on the field and to help, you know, call the games. And so, I, you know, I did it. And then, and then after my kids moved on from Little League, you know, then, then I was asked, you want to you umpire and get the uniform and the whole deal? So I did that and then went up to, the, you know, Babe Ruth League. And so, and, the, and I'll tell you the reason why I continue to umpire. Not because I just love the game of baseball, but just because it was an awesome way for me to relate to people that otherwise I would never meet. Because, you know, I don't get out much. It's just, you know, you guys. And so it was good for me to get, you know, out into the culture and the community and just be able to relate to people. And we have to find ways that we can connect with people on a certain level. And this is what Paul is saying here. Now, let's finish out the chapter. How much time do we have left here? Five minutes. Okay, I can do it. Verse, verse, uh, verse 23. He says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Verse 24 to the end is a very important section. He says this, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified 
for the prize, okay? So here's that, the opening two questions we had, you know, what kind of freedom does a Christian have? And then the second question was, can I misuse my freedom and disqualify myself? And that's how he ends this chapter. Because his point is, you, you, you don't want to use your freedom to disqualify yourself. However, and then he makes this comparison of the Christian life to an athlete. This is a great section. Paul was a sports fan, friends. When you look through the epistles, he's making regular references to some athletic competition. In this case, he's talking about the races. And he talks about the games. You know, in verse 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. And at this particular time, Corinth was the capital of the Isthmian Games. It was, it was like the Olympics. The Olympics were also happening at the same time, but the capital city for the Olympics was Athens. The capital city for the Isthmian Games was Corinth. And he's using sports analogy here, okay? Paul is a sports fan. He, Paul is the Skip Bayless of the New Testament. Three people know who Skip Bayless is, great, all right. So, but, you know, but here he is, and he's, and, but regularly through the epistle, he's on ESPN, but anyway, he's, it, but, but he, 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 writes, he writes here, and he talks in different times in the epistles, he talks about running a race, he talks about competing, he talks about boxing, there's a reference here to boxing, all right, and, and he speaks of it as like the Christian life, and he draws on a modern parallel, the athletic games here, and being like an athlete to understand a little bit about the Christian life, running the race. And one of the things he says here is, number one, compete as an athlete to win. Compete as an athlete to win, all right? Christianity is not a spectator sport. It is not. You cannot live the Christian life from the stands. You have to get down on the field and get into the game. This is about participating in this race. The Christian life is like that. It is a journey. It is a race. And we are to be in this race to win. And the way that we win in this race, he says, giving us two terms, he says, you're going to have to go into strict training, he says in verse 25. And then he says, I beat my body and make it my slave. Now, this, this, this isn't like, you know, he's torturing himself, all right? What he's saying between these two phrases in verse 25 and 27 is this. He's saying we have to live a self-controlled life and a disciplined life. And anybody who's been an athlete at any level understands that if you really want to excel at your game, at your sport, you have to be disciplined and you have to be self-controlled. There's, there's, a, there's a, a workout regimen, there's a dietary regimen, there are, there's a, there are strict things that you must do if you want to be at the top of your game. And as Christians, we also have to be, in that sense, self-controlled and disciplined. There are some things in this life, because the prize is more important than our personal freedom sometimes, right? We're going to deny ourselves certain things. We're going to say no to certain things. We're going to say yes to other things. We're going to be careful about our discipline, our regiment, our lives, being self-controlled and disciplined people. Paul would say to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 12, he says, It is grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. All right, it is grace, Titus 2.12, it is grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and unholiness in this world. How is it that grace teaches us those things? Because, friends, if you, if you wrap your mind around grace, how much God has done for you and how much he has given us, though we never deserved it, how loving he is, forgiving he is, how he has given us the hope of eternal life. If we wrap our minds around and focus on the grace of God, it motivates us to holy living. When you begin to recognize and appreciate the love of your Father and how much God has done for us and given us his Son, Jesus, to die on a cross for us, and you continue to make that your focus, it goes a long way to helping you to say no to ungodliness and worldliness in this present age while you wait for the blessed hope. Live self-controlled, disciplined lives because we're running a race. And he says here in the rest of this section that there is a prize worth running for. There is a prize worth 
running for. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, he talks about the prize also in Philippians 3.14. He defines it. And here's what he says. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's what he says. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has called me heavenward. So heaven is the ultimate prize, right? We're, we're living out a Christian life and we're running this race not because we want to die well, but because we want to live well forever, okay? For Christians, this life is as bad as it gets. For non-Christians, this life is as good as it gets. But for a believer, this is as bad as it gets. I'm running the race not because of this life. I'm running the race for the prize that awaits me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Who else? Amen? Who else? Amen? Amen. Running the race for the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So live disciplined, self-controlled lives that we might press on to win that prize for which God has called us heavenward. Paul's closing words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 would be this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. May that be our testimony as well. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we do thank you for this letter to the Corinthians, a reminder to us about our freedoms, that we need to carefully examine those things in our lives, that we would not live a life in the extremes, that we would not live a life of legalism, but neither would we indulge the sinful nature. Help us to ask these questions so that we could live a life that glorifies you and that is considerate towards others. And Father, we pray that you would help us with the grace of your Holy Spirit to run this race with perseverance, that we might be disciplined in our Christian lives, that we might be self-controlled, that we might be willing to do away with things, to sacrifice certain things for the benefit of our eternal reward, that we would run the race in order to get the prize, the ultimate reward of heaven. Lord, I pray for those who might be here tonight or those who will listen later by podcast that if they don't know that when they die, they'll go to heaven, then I pray that tonight they'll surrender their heart to Jesus. I'm going to pause in my prayer just with your heads bowed and before we're dismissed. I just want to make sure that as we talk about the ultimate prize of heaven, that there's no doubts among anyone here or who will listen to this later about whether or not you'll go to heaven when you die. So let me clear it up for you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for you, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The reason that any of us have the hope of heaven is because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That means that you believe he died on a cross for you. That means that he had you in mind. That means that you understand that he paid the price for your sin and my sin. And that if you believe in him and receive him as your Lord and Savior in your heart, you shall be saved and go to heaven when you die. If you've never made a decision for Christ, I invite you tonight to invite Christ into your life. Ask him to change you. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and commit your life to him, won't you? And so if that's your desire tonight, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. And you can just pray right where you're seated and you can invite Christ into your life. Just pray this simple prayer after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on a cross for me. I thank you that you love me so much that you had me in mind when you died on that cross. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Take over my life. I yield control of my life to you. And I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Believing by faith 
in your finished work on the cross so that when I die, I'll go to heaven and be with you forever and ever. The ultimate prize in Christ Jesus. And it's in your name that I pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Amen. What a great service as usual. Remember, don't forget to check out the links below. Thanks for tuning in.